As exciting as today's language models are, there are many other important directions for researchers to explore. Looking to the past, models like the restricted Boltzmann machine that aren't studied as much today might still hold valuable insights for us. The field of deep learning needs many different types of researchers with different talents and interests, even if discourse seems dominated by a few lines of research. Few researchers have made such staggering contributions to deep learning over such a long period of time as my guest today. Hugo Larochel leads Google Brain, now Google DeepMind Montreal, and is an adjunct professor at the University de Montreal and a Canada CIFAR chair. We discussed his research from 2004 to today, developments and algorithms like RBMs and autoencoders, representation learning, what he's learned about doing good science, machine learning publication culture, and much more. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you have comments, questions, guest suggestions, feel free to leave me a comment on Substack, or shoot an email to editor at thegradient.pub. But now, without further ado, Hugo Larochel. <music> Professor Larochel, I think that you are probably one of the best known names in the space of deep learning right now. And I, I personally find just the level, quality, amount of impact you've had on the field kind of staggering. And so I think my, my natural starting question here is, how did you get into AI in the first place? Uh, thanks for the too kind introduction. That's, um, it's, it, it almost sounds weird to, to hear, but I have been very fortunate to get into the field of AI and I guess machine learning is how we would usually talk about it when I started uh, at a pretty good time, a fortunate time. Um, so I, um, kind of got into, was really interested in mathematics and computers in high school. And, um, and that was about as much that I knew that I, in terms of a professional direction I wanted to take. And, um, at some point during, uh, CIGEP in, uh, in Quebec, which is kind of like in between uh, high school and college, um, I um, got sort of intrigued by AI, not really knowing what it was, but, you know, I guess the, the most AI I had seen was really like, you know, AI and video games, I guess. And um, and then I, I did this, um, there was some sort of mathematics competition that uh, I participated in, did well enough that I could go to some sort of summer school to teach us a bit more advanced math. And I met a professor there in the math department at the University of Montreal where I had already applied to do a CS degree and uh, talked to her. She was asking what my interests were and I said AI. And she said, oh, you know, like math is actually pretty useful for, for a lot of AI. So you might want to do a CS and math uh, degree. Uh, and and that convinced me, so I switched before I I I, I had to start, and I, I went in there, and that that was a huge deal because that really helped me. Indeed, like it was a great advice because I saw CS students really struggling with the machine learning as they were first introduced to it, uh, whereas like it was much more approachable to me because I had you know more math training, and at the University of Montreal, I I you know at some point I wanted to do a during my undergrad, doing an uh, internship during the summer. Uh, first year, I approached, uh, I was just looking for AI professors. Um, and Yashua Benjil's name came up in my search. So I went to his office asking if he was taking interns. And the first year, he, he actually said, like, I didn't have enough math. So he couldn't really take me right away. But the second year, he did. And then things kind of took off from there. I joined essentially, you know, as an intern in his lab, and I stayed there until the end of my PhD, really. I think that one aspect of the background that you hadn't developed, you worked with Ashio Benjo, you worked with Geoff Hinton, 
And so I think that somebody looking at that would very much read your views, your research directions as being brought up within the, the connectionist tradition. My question for you there, perhaps to frame some of what we're going to talk about today, is I think that connectionist versus symbolist, that's maybe a little bit of a, a reductive way of looking at what are some pretty complicated debates about the field of AI, of where things are going. Perhaps to turn that into a question for you, if somebody were sort of looking at your body of work, at the way you think about machine learning, and kind of filtering that through the label connectionist, what might surprise them about some of the ways you think about the field? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, certainly, yeah, when I started, I mean, at that point, Yashua's lab was very much connected to, you know, the NeurIPS community and, and which was largely dominated by at least machine learning approaches as opposed to symbolic approaches. And that included neural nets, but at the time they were not popular at all. And I think I've always, I'm trying to think of, is there any work that I can think of that really um, I wouldn't necessarily attach to, you know, neural nets and connectionism. But really, I think all of it has been kind of like, it was the first kind of method that I learned to work with. That was really what Yashua was focused on, even though at the time, methods that were more popular were uh, kernel methods and, you know, methods associated not with non-convex optimization, but convex optimization, which was kind of considered as a big, breakthrough of being able to do nonlinear models with uh, and frame it as a convex problem because then you didn't have to deal with difficult optimization uh, problems. But he sort of really pushed on uh, on this method along with Jeff and, and other people. And I think very early on, I was sort of attached to this mindset that this was a kind of approach that was really worth pursuing more. And uh, I mean, I remember the first time I went to NeurIPS, I was actually very, a, a little bit depressed after my experience because so little work were things I was really familiar with, which was neural networks. A lot of it was other types of machine learning methods. A lot of it coming with like theoretical um, characterization of their generalization properties and and partly facilitated by the in some ways, the simplicity of those methods or the, the sort of convenient mathematical properties that that they had that neural nets didn't have. But, you know, Yashua was very compelling, convincing as to like why this approach was the one that was needed. And that led to a lot of the work that I did on looking at non-local generalization and, and really focusing on this idea that like the biggest challenge is to have the right methods that allow for generalizing you know, further away from the training data than say local kernel methods were able to do. And a lot of that was really what we we're trying to, to tackle, you know, from the beginning. So during this kind of first phase of your research journey, I kind of partitioned this as the 2004 to 2009 years. This is kind of leading up to just a few years before the ImageNet moment. You mentioned your non-local estimation of manifold structure paper. I think although this paper is kind of pointing out like a weakness with non-parametric kernel methods, the idea of thinking about manifolds, I think maybe would remind a lot of listeners about the way that some critics perhaps of deep learning today would call deep neural networks manifold manipulators. I guess I'd love for you to maybe introduce this paper in the context of priming some intuitions for us about how that framing might be correct, but then also what it misses. So uh, the idea behind this work was um, uh, it was very much grounded in the uh, work at the time that was more focused on kernelized type learning. And it was based on and was looking at density estimation. So modeling the distribution of some data set of inputs, the data generating distribution. And there was a big challenge in doing that well for high dimensional inputs. So at the time, you know, even generating convincing handwritten digits was kind of an unsolved problem and really difficult. And um, there was one approach, a kernel approach, which was essentially take all of your training example and then assume a little Gaussian around centered at each 
sample in your training set and essentially assigning equal probabilities in all directions, sort of you know quickly decaying as you got away from from the training example and taking the average of all of these Gaussians, like a huge non-parametric Gaussian mixture. And um, and then Yashua had done some work before where um, the idea was to recognize that assuming that you can now have variations in all high dimensional directions around a sample, if you're thinking of, for instance, of modeling images, that was very unrealistic that images could only have factors of variations and um, that had very few degrees of freedom, which suggested, you know, having that there would be some sort of implicit manifold and where most of the data distribution mass should be around any sample. And they had this idea of just, you know, taking examples around training, each training sample, looking at its k-nearest neighbor. And from that estimating what might be the tangent of the manifold by the, doing a local PCA and, and using that to represent the kinds of uh, variations you could have around each example. And hopefully, you know, hoping this would capture things like a character, for instance, might be, you could maybe rotate it, you can maybe translate it. Uh, it's, it's sort of um, absolute location in, in the frame of view. You could maybe thicken its, um, its the character trait and so on. And then with non-local uh, manifold parsing, the idea there was to say, well, that structure, there's regularity to it. So instead of estimating it locally around each training example, uh, maybe we should try to capture that regularity by having a neural net produce these directions of, of variations around each potential location of the, of the data manifold. And... Um, and the idea was that by doing this, hopefully we can have a better estimate of this, uh, of, of the these properties of the manifold, and therefore get a better density estimate. Um, so essentially, assuming that well, any any digit can be rotated, any digit can be locally translated. So therefore, there ought to be some sort of common structure that captures all of these potential variations. And um, and the way of of doing that, of having a, some sort of more less local, more global representation of, of some information was to use a neural network. So the neural net would take a training example or an, or an example and then produce what would be the, uh, the, inform the information about which directions of variations could we expect that hopefully would correspond for digits to things like rotation, translation, and so on. And, um, and sharing all of those learning signals about this local manifold across the input space which made it non-local. Um, and, and that had some pretty good results in terms of, um, in terms of density estimation, um, though it's an expensive method, especially if you have a large training set, because that still assumes that you're keeping around all the training examples to do density estimation. But it was kind of a, I think it, in, in the line of research that I was involved in during my PhD, it was kind of a way for Yashua to kind of take methods that were more of the popular type local kernel method estimations and kind of showing, well, there's part of that problem that is actually not well tackled by this kernel formulation or approach and better tackled by having a single model that that is able to share statistical predictions across the whole input space and sort of eating away at part of the things we didn't like about kernel methods, showing that a neural net could do it better and it was kind of like one sort of example of that, that uh, Yashua's lab was really trying to push uh, inside the NeurIPS community in particular. When you were exploring this, as you mentioned, one of the core unsolved problems was even recognizing handwritten digits, a vision problem. I think when we kind of look at the articulation of local manifold learning, as you put it, where your embedding for an example is kind of an interpolation of the coordinates of its neighbors. That sounds an awful lot like whatever we're dealing with is kind of defined by the company it keeps, which sounds, again, a little bit like the distributional hypothesis. Although even I think in language, when you conceive of words as embeddings, of course, there are maybe very non-obvious jumps in terms of how different words might be related to one another in an embedding space. But that does that kind of connection at least does make me curious how you think a little bit about maybe expanding some of the ideas here in terms of looking at the whole input space as sort of being a better way of developing embeddings and how that maybe applies to 
different modalities, different problems of concern. Oh, that's a great connection, actually, which I don't think I had made those so far that um, indeed for, you know, for language, we sort of use successfully as a community the idea that um, if you sort of learn about what might be the next word or the previous word, you might learn something meaningful about the syntax or the semantics of, of that space. Um, so I guess, that, yeah, you're right. In some ways, it's it's related. Um, and certainly, this is something we dug into even more when we um, started looking at doing fully unsupervised training on neural net, not in the context of distribution learning, but more in the context of um, learning and, and, you know, and then we use backbone now as 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 the term for that, but using learning a hidden layer that would capture some of the uh, properties of the the data distribution, and hopefully then like abstract semantic concepts that are useful. And one example was uh, and work that I was really fortunate to to be able to contribute to was the denoising autoencoder, where there was a little bit of that idea too, which was well, what if we take an example, an input, and um, to train a representation for it, we would quote unquote remove some of its dimensions, some of its, um, it would mask some of its inputs and then try to fill those out. And so reconstruct the original uh, version of that input based on a corrupted version of it. And actually this kind of came at the initial ideas I remember it wasn't so much at least for me, like the reason I thought this was a really cool idea, it wasn't so much because of this intuition that learning about the local properties of uh, the data generating distribution will help. Uh, but it was more that, so right before the nosing and tone coders, I contributed to a paper, Grady Layer-wise pre-training of neural nets, uh, which was one of the early papers of, uh, in quote unquote deep learning, that is, this is the time we started using that term for describing that kind of research, and it was building on the idea of using restricted Boltzmann machine to pre-train the layers of a deep neural net, which Jeff Hinton had, had proposed, and we're kind of exploring this idea in many different directions. And my contribution to that work was to say, well, instead of pre-training using a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is a model that maybe not so many people are familiar with now, but was an unsupervised one-layer neural net training procedure, um, which at the time, I, I admit, I, I didn't understand super well. So I was trying to find ways of doing something simpler. And the one thing that came to mind is, you know, why don't we just have a single layer where you do a forward pass in the hidden layer and you try to do a forward back, uh, another forward pass back into the uh, a layer of the same size as the input layer and just try to reconstruct comparing your reconstruction with the original input and do gradient descent on that reconstruction objective. Not really knowing at the time that you know this is an idea that had been explored before and um, it had come under different names. Auto associator was one term we used, and auto encoder is, is more what we use today. And so, in that early work on greedy dealerized pre training, I, su I suggested maybe we can just use that as an alternative to the RBM for pre training. And it was not working as well, but it was working fairly well. It was working better than not doing any pre training, which was really. One of my first kind of thing I felt I had really contributed from my own ideas that that seemed to have legs. But one problem with this approach was that if um, your tone coder was autocomplete, uh, overcomplete, I mean, which means if its hidden layer is as big as its input layer, the there's nothing that forbids the neural net of learning a representation that's just a copy of the input. So copying each individual, say if it's these are images, copying each individual pixel into its own hidden unit and then re, you know copying again into the output layer uh, and solve the problem trivially and so we we were we were hoping to find ways that we could still keep the idea of a tone quarter but not have this obvious failure mode that it had and then i went in at some day so pascal vincent was another junior professor at the department at the time who had been a phd student with yashua benjo i happened to go in his office to talk about some of the work I'm doing. And he suggests this idea that maybe a way of avoiding this kind of copying solution of the input into the hidden layer would simply be to add noise to the input such that the problem it's trying to solve is not reconstruct the original input, but 
to actually uncover some of the noise that we added into it. And immediately I thought, oh, that's a really intu intuitively made sense that it would certainly avoid this problem. And if it needs to do some sort of denoising, it probably needs to learn about something about the regularities in the input distribution and what makes different pixels, you know, codependent in some way. And the first time we tried it, it just, it was just working. So the thing we would do at the time quite a bit is we would look at, we would train say on MNIST <clears throat> and then we'd look at the filters learned by the hidden units. And what you were hoping to see, and this is something you would kind of see in restricted Boltzmann machines is um, structures, the filters would kind of look like stroke detectors. You know, it looks like it, it was looking for some um, uh, pen stroke with some empty background around it. And we were not really getting that with autoencoders. And we thought it was probably because it was, it was too tempted to just copy each individual pixel. But as soon as we added just a bit of noise and had the denoise encoder, we started seeing the stroke detectors, you know, emerge. And... And so that was that was pretty exciting, and, and that led to the denoising autoencoder paper. And this led to a series of paper that started, you know, beyond just this kind of like intuitive fix, which was, well, you know, if it copies the input, let's make let's design a problem where copying the input wouldn't wouldn't solve the problem because it would just copy the noise as well. To so it started from that uh, to essentially, oh well, we can actually show that. Uh, solving this problem is in some ways more formally learning about the local distribution structure of the data generating distribution. Uh, and that was shown more formally by, uh, mostly by other people after who worked on this idea in, in Yasha's lab. And so, yeah, in some ways, this is kind of a powerful idea that um, that is also without us really knowing, I think initially behind the denoising autoencoder. Yeah, I'd love to return to some of this denoising autoencoder work later and kind of the, the representation learning perspectives developed therein. But I do want to um, also talk about a couple of the other papers we had during this section of your work. And I feel there are a number of interesting ones here. You had one on classification using discriminative restricted Boltzmann machines. Perhaps maybe we can put a pin in this one and connect it to some later papers because you sort of continued work you had a very interesting later infinite Boltzmann machine abstraction that I want to talk about as well. But perhaps where we can focus here is some of your other papers. So in zero data learning of new tasks, where I want to start with this paper actually is you had a very interesting phrase in the paper where you say, we finally conclude by discussing how this new framework could lead to a novel perspective on how to extend machine learning towards AI. And I think that little snippet, extend machine learning towards AI, is something that somebody today might hear and, you know, might, might wrinkle their brow a little bit just in terms of the term usage. I think that there is a little bit of a difference between maybe how terms were used, thrown around when you were working on this paper, and then how in today's world everything is AI, whether it's, you know, whatever flavor of machine learning or deep learning. And so I guess I'm a little bit curious just how you were thinking about the the terminology back then yeah no that's uh it's funny you cut that so um people would really not use the term ai in you know mid 2000s um it was it was just not it was associated with types of methods that ended up failing in some ways you know expert systems and things like that and the machine learning community took much more. It started having, in some ways, more success by drawing from ideas and statistics and thinking more in a statistical way. And also kind of, I guess, in some ways, toning down a little bit their immediate goals in terms of what kinds of problems they would try to, to solve. And so it'd be much more task-specific, you know, uh, trying to solve specific problems individually and less about trying to understand, you know, intelligence, which is, has been a long, you know, standing goal for Jeff Hinton, for instance, who was thinking about machine learning really as a way to uh, maybe understand better the, the human intelligence even. But, but that was just not a line of thought that was popular. It was a bit derided even. I was, it, it felt maybe a bit too grandiose and, um, at least in the machine learning community represented by NeurIPS and ICML also at the time. 
And so, um, and so that term was not used all that much. Uh, now this work, um, the zero data learning paper, um, which as a side note to this day, I regret we didn't call it zero shot learning. Um, it just, at the time that wasn't a term, but it was clearly the perfect term for it. And not so long after, about the same time, there is a paper that calls what they're doing zero shot learning paper, uh, zero shot learning, which is exactly the right term, which is the term we use today. And people kept asking us, what does that mean, zero data learning? And and people never really got it. So, um, but but in, in I mean, this to some extent speak to like how early we were about thinking about doing this kind of developing this kind of model. But but so this work we published at we had tried to publish it at NeurIPS, I think, and weren't successful. And then I think the ICML and AAAI deadline were coming up. And I was just, I was kind of like, well, in some ways, like some of the ideas that drive this paper are maybe closer to the AI community, as we would call it then, uh, than the machine learning community. So we so I thought, let's just send it to AAAI. I never sent the paper there. And it was kind of convenient for me because their deadline, I think, was one week before the ICML deadline. And for the ICML, I was trying to push for the denoising autoencoder paper at the time. So I thought, okay, maybe it's just convenient. I can focus on one paper and then shift on the other. And um, I'm wondering, I should look back whether we actually put that sentence referring AI in our NeurIPS submission. But I wouldn't be surprised that we didn't just for that reason. Just we, we didn't want to ruffle, you know, we, we didn't want people to react to to that statement. But the triple AI, well, AI is in the name of the conference. So that seemed just natural for us to make a statement like that. Um, and I was looking back at this work also. And when you continue in the conclusion, I kind of hint at what is essentially kind of prompt engineering in some ways of the idea of providing a textual description for deriving a machine learning predictor or you know, a, a model for a task. And that was very much what I had in mind, like hoping that one day we would get there and that this was like our first attempt at seeing whether we could do this on very simple problems, incredibly simple problems. And you know, I can't say that I would predict it quite the shape of, of what we're able to do today with, with prompt engineering and whatnot. But to me, I've been uh, really excited to see this particular kind of work because it kind of reminded me of what we were the ideas we were playing with, you know, during my my PhD, uh, this was Yashua Benjo and Dumitru Eran. Um, and um, so it's really nice to see kind of like how far we've gone from this zero data learning, zero shot learning initial idea to what we can do today. That was exactly, I think, the set of connections that I made from this paper as well. I pulled this quotation from, I want to say towards the end, that one would expect an artificial intelligence system to understand instructions specifying a task and perform the task without any additional supervised learning if it has already been trained on related tasks described in the same language, which, as you said, very much hints towards prompt engineering. I was thinking about some of the different flavors of in-context learning we're seeing today as something that's maybe even a little bit more similar to that description. And so it's it's fascinating just to kind of hear how you were, you were hinting towards that quite a while ago. I mean, it also sees, to me, that's some evidence that uh, we got here from the work of a lot of people, really. Like, you know, I think um, there are some people who definitely have had an outsized influence on where we are today. But it's also a lot of that wouldn't have been possible without a lot of, you know, perhaps smaller contributions that just push things a little bit forward or kept some general idea alive for a little bit so that we kept as a community exploring it in different ways. And I view kind of this paper as being my my little contribution to kind of keeping this idea alive. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, definitely across fields, not just in machine learning, but I suppose often the story we tell ourselves of the history of its development, we almost have to simplify just so we can kind of keep a hold on what happened. And so naturally, certain figures are going to stand out in that. But I guess often or sometimes the story about like, I guess I, the, the kind of case in point I think of always is like Hegel's telling of the German idealist story and kind of putting himself as like the person who really developed absolute idealism, which in many people's telling, really, he was just a great synthesizer who put a lot of ideas together that had kind of come before him. And so he did contribute something. But 
many of the ideas that were claimed to be original were kind of already there. And then so now we coming in after have to figure out and decipher like what actually came from where. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, I agree with that. There are two other interesting papers during this period that I think might be good to kind of pair together. So you were working on exploring strategies for training deep neural networks and deep learning using robust interdependent codes. And so you, you mentioned a little bit about the greedy layer-wise training strategy. And so I guess I'm just sort of curious about when you were looking at some of these different training strategies, I guess now the way that people think about training a deep neural network, it's pretty standard. But how were people thinking about and sort of adapting strategies at the time when you were working on this paper? Yeah, so uh, this, um, so the second paper that came later was kind of the journal extension of the, which was the thing people did at the time. They would publish a conference paper and then for the stuff that, you know, was worth digging more into, then you sort of do a more uh, a fuller version of that work with more experiments and exploring other um, surrounding questions and then uh, publishing that, say, at GMLR, for instance, which is what we did here. Um, and this was very much at the beginning where we sort of realized the value of not just doing end-to-end -end gradient descent on the objective you care about, but perhaps um, doing some unsupervised learning, this is what we're ag advocating for, to help with the training of these deep models. I think a lot of the motivation then doesn't ap doesn't apply as much today, which was at the time, you know, early on in, in these days of 2006 and, and seven and eight, we weren't training with GPUs. So we were looking for algorithm contributions that would help us train larger networks with less compute and doing layer-wise pre-training was one way of doing that. And it turns out a successful way of doing it. Um, but with more compute, then some of these ideas weren't as useful in terms of training larger models faster, but they remain interesting from the point of view of uh, maybe it's, it's a good regularization signal. Maybe it encourages the network to learn um, features that are more likely to generalize and and it fell very much within kind of the similar ideas related to unsupervised learning and transfer learning and 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 generalization, you know, non-local generalization. It sort of fed on these ideas. Now, at the time, we were getting a lot of questions about, you know, how how do you pick the number of hidden units in, in each layers and things like that? So we thought maybe that's an opportunity of doing these experiments, seeing what are good designs. And I think what we had found is that essentially the same, roughly the same number of hidden units per layer was working fine. So it probably wasn't like just giving advice on people were doing research with these kinds of models at the time with the compute we had, uh, what might be like a fairly robust strategy. So I think later on, we weren't, it kind of became apparent that the if there was going to be benefit of doing unsupervised learning, it was probably not going to be uh to help with our ability to optimize these models. It was going to be more about for it to learn different features that are going to have better generalization properties. I think that has stuck around. And you know, now we do a lot of unsupervised pre-training before fine-tuning to some task. And I think in many ways, um, you know, a, a lot of that sort of is connected with these initial ideas of pre-training that we were exploring then, where I think really, as far as I know, the, you know, for me anyways, the, the, the work that actually um, sort of really put forward this idea initially was Jeff Hinton's work. And actually he has like a tech report that is, um, he has the work on deep belief networks, which has this idea of doing pre-training and then globally training a generative model of the data and its label. But then he had put this, uh, tech report, which I'm not sure he ever published, but I just said, oh, actually, another thing you can just do is you do pre-training with restricted Boltzmann machines, but then you just had like a softmax layer and then fine tune and do more regular back prop training in a way that was completely disconnected with uh, deep belief networks, where the deep belief network framing had been used to motivate using specifically restricted Boltzmann machine pre-training. But this tech report was kind of saying, well, you don't need all of that fancy probabilistic motivation for doing this pre-training, uh, we can sort of 
at a more intuitive level, think of it as it's learning a good hierarchy of features. And then we just need to tune it a little bit for the particular task you're interested in. And, and, and that turned out to work okay. And I, it was one of the very early, to me, there might be things before that I'm not aware of, but to me, that really illustrated that point. And that has you know stuck around for a long time until today, really. The other work that I kind of wanted to mention, I think also did something really interesting, I guess, the idea it, it introduced, which was sort of allowing for interactions between neurons in the same layer of a network. And I think you specifically described the limitation you were trying to overcome as the elements of representation can't interact in an inhibitory or excitatory fashion. I guess I'd love to hear you elaborate on that articulation a little bit and what you were thinking about. Yeah. So um, this was at a time where um, I think maybe more than today, we were really using ideas from neuroscience to take inspiration on how should we should change our neural net architectures. And, um, and one of the things that was coming up um, was that in the brain, you have layers where there are these kind of inhibitory uh, interactions between, between neurons. And it wasn't really clear that our sort of feed-forward, multi-layer perceptron kind of representation of, of a model could really enable that or represent that. And so people were really interested in sparse coding as an unsupervised method, in particular in, in Yanni Kern's lab. Uh, remember sort of reading a lot of papers from him, Marco Rello, Renzato, and a number of other people uh, from that lab at the time. And one of the ways in which they also motivated um, using sparse coding was that when you did inference in the sparse coding model, you didn't just, just do a simple forward pass. You had this kind of iterative um, process that were, where certain neurons would push down the activity of other neurons in, in the same layer to try to infer what is the right sparse representation of a given input. Um, and, and so I was trying, trying to see, okay, well, in denosing autoencoders, how might we be able to have this, this same kind of um, process for calculating a representation. And that paper was about essentially exploring that and, and trying to see whether there was some benefit in doing this. And in a somewhat constrained you know, setting we looked at in that paper, we did find some. But you know, going back and thinking about this work, it, it, the thing that comes to mind is how much more uh, neuroscientific inspiration we were. It was still inspiration. You know, like in, in no ways were these ideas like, all that close to how the brain actually works. But, you know, I think of, of this as being an idea that was explored and a lot of the motivation was uh, from neuroscience. Um, and also at the time, you know, if you look back at the um, Greedy Leroy's pre-training paper and a lot of paper in that area, no one was using RELUs, rectified linear units. Um, it was all TANH or maybe sigmoids. Um, and I remember when we the idea of RELUs came up in Jeff's lab and also in Yashua's lab uh, a bit after or about the same time, a lot of the motivation was, well, you know, the quote-unquote activation function in real neurons isn't really all that much upper bounded. And it has more of this big linear regime. And that was a lot of also the motivation for at least taking this, this idea seriously. Um, and so yeah, so that that particular paper of mine on interdependent neurons, like that was very much uh, a lot of the initial inspiration, which just that was from neuroscience. You do have a later paper, I think, which also brings back a little bit of discussion in the neuroscientific community, which I think will be kind of interesting to touch on as well. But I'd love to move into the 2009 to 2011 phase where you were doing your postdoc. You worked with Geoffrey Hinton. And so maybe just as a starting question, I'd love to get your sense of, as I kind of mentioned, maybe this is leading up to the AlexNet moment and where deep learning, I think, really started to hit the mainstream of machine learning research. Did you feel that there was any particular, I guess, set of shifts that were happening during these couple of years? Well, I, I think... Uh... And uh, notably, this the ImageNet moment sort of happened. I think I had left the lab at that point, uh, but I had, you know, definitely. I mean, it was a pretty amazing uh, 
moment to be doing a postdoc, the number of people uh, that I had a chance to interact with then uh, was remarkable. Um, and because um, I think I'll, uh, um, the key inside behind ImageNet, a lot of uh, the ImageNet moment, a lot of it was just Ilya at that point being convinced that we just need to train bigger models on a large data set and just finding ways to do that. And I think people have heard this story a lot, like from Ilya or Jeff, and, you know, like co-opting Alex to kind of work on this and really just nail using a GPU to uh, go much larger scale and so on. And I, in some ways, it took a little bit of going uh, back against this idea that you needed unsupervised pre-training to make large networks work. That it it wasn't true that to fit to fit a, 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 a supervised neural network on some data that you needed these algorithmic tricks. And I remember before that, you know, the um, Ilya was working with. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is going back so much. I'm 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 messing up names right now. But on this idea of training large autoencoders, uh, so not you know, image classifiers, anything like that, but large uh, autoencoders and showing you could do it um, without any pre-training. And I think that kind of convinced Ilya at the time that oh, I guess you just need a really good optimizer. You don't really need this um, alternative objective of doing unsupervised learning. Um, now, uh, but before that, there was still a lot of interest in, in various forms of unsupervised learning. And at the time when I was in the lab, one thing that I wanted to push was um, to look at, um, I, I was a bit frustrating how we evaluated unsupervised learning methods. A lot of it was just like looking at filters and and trying to do an indirect evaluation of the features. and But at, in some ways, and, and there was starting to be some work from Rasen Sarakudina, for instance, on actually evaluating the quality of the generative model using uh, by looking at the average likelihood of test samples uh, or log likelihood, and um, and I, but it was kind of it was sort of an approximation doing that estimation. It was kind of frustrating to me, and I started trying to figure out: Can I use? Well, again, me sort of thinking: Okay. My contribution to this might be, can we get generative models that aren't based on restricted Boltzmann machines or Boltzmann machines, but are based instead of more like for neural networks? And then thinking about, and things that kind of look like an autoencoder. And with time, it's, uh, and at the time talking with Ian Murray in particular, was also a postdoc in Jeffrey's lab. Um, we came up with this idea, of maybe a neural net can represent the conditionals in some um conditional decomposition of the joint. And if we have this, maybe we, we can finally get real log likelihood and actually really know how good it is to capture the input distribution. And that led to the NAID work, neural autoregression uh, distribution estimation. And I think it was more these kinds of ideas that when I was there as a postdoc that we were exploring. Um, I was still doing some restricted Boltzmann machine stuff. I mean, it was in Jeff's lab. It sort of made sense. A lot of people were doing that. Um, and and Jeff had this because um, there was still an interest in trying to scale up these classifiers, image classifiers. Um, and one thing that Jeff really wanted to explore was the idea of using foveation. Um, so having a model that can actively sense the field of view to determine how to gather information about the image so as to determine what class it belongs to. And because, you know, Jeff was really keen on the restricted Boltzmann machine kind of approach, this is the framework that we use to sort of explore that, where we'd have a model that would uh, make a decision as to where it would look into the original image and then get a small glimpse at it. So getting partial information around the location in the image and then collect that information so as to be able to classify it. And that led to some really neat ideas that we explored. Um, but uh, again, in some ways, it's a reflection of that. Okay, at this time, we were trying to go about training larger neural nets on 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 more data and and bigger data using algorithmic ideas as opposed to like just engineering. It seems like also 
kind of during this period and before it, there was more, I guess, explicit thought put into some of the ways in which representation learning was occurring. So in your stacked denoising autoencoders paper, you do notice that denoising autoencoders learn these Gabor-like edge detectors from natural image patches and larger stroke detectors from digit images. I believe maybe in earlier papers I looked at as well, there was this kind of confluence of the training strategies and then the different levels of abstraction of representation that layers would learn about the images. To me, it just felt interesting, maybe the different way in which you were explicating these thoughts. Because I think that when I kind of came into it and trained my first neural network, it was just like, well, you know, you just throw VGG16 at a bunch of data and oh, look, like the first layer learns these things and you can visualize it, which seems very different from how people were thinking about the representations learned when you were getting to work on these things. Yeah, well, uh, we liked the idea of, of um, at least, you know, the kind of research I did, um, not really toying with the architecture as much as just toying with the objective that it's trying to optimize. And, and then looking at filters to get a sense of, because it's a very indirect relationship. Um, like if you constrain, if you use a convnet, you're kind of constraining filters to be localized. It's just by construction, that's how it's going to be. But um, if we can find an objective that naturally leads to that, then it feels like you're onto something perhaps because uh, we know in the brain, you know, the early visual areas there, you have these kind of edge detectors. So, so perhaps that allows us to kind of get an insight into more general principles that um, lead to the kind of intelligence that, you know, we're capable of. So I think um, a lot of, these kinds of explorations and not really playing with, you know, trying to get a really efficient uh, architecture that scales to large images and constructing it and hand designing it was 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 a lot motivated by that. Um, and in some ways, I guess it still legitimized the idea of reconstruction and, and or denoising reconstruction, which we still see in some shape or form today and uh, in training large language models, for instance, that some of them are trained on a denoising-like objective, or we're seeing a rise these days of mass autoencoders for uh, doing unsupervised learning on large images. Um, and so, um, but the, the idea of not playing with the architecture so much and really trying to see, is it going to find something like that? I think was trying to get a in some ways, a cleaner signal on, do we have the right objective? Do we have the right principle for training these models? That makes a lot of sense to me. The last paper during this section I wanted to discuss was your work on tractable multivariate binary density estimation. And this very interesting idea you produced, the restricted Boltzmann forest, which I have not encountered before. I guess I'd love for you to maybe introduce, I imagine many of our listeners probably haven't heard Boltzmann Forest either. So I think it would just be really interesting to hear you expound on the, the synthesis of this idea. Yeah, uh, this is part of, uh, uh, well, I, so I, the tractable component is, this is around the time where I was really interested in trying to be able to have a, um, a, an exact measure of the quality of the generative model using log likelihoods. And so it turns out that with a restricted Boltzmann machine, if if the input layer is not too big, uh, then you, or if the hidden layer is not too big, one or the other, you can get a an exact estimate uh, of the uh, of the partition function, which leads you to getting the 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 log likelihood. And then at the time, yeah, we were sort of interested in in hidden layers that had a bit more structure than a bunch of parallel neurons. And essentially, the motivation here was that, well, if we have these three structured subset of units in a layer, then we're at a high level, we're introducing some interconnection between them and maybe some form of inhibition and so on. And maybe that's valuable, again, because we, we see these kind of within layer sort of inhibitory kind of interactions. So that was the high level intuition for exploring uh, different structures for the hidden layer. And here, the reason why we would explore... So essentially, we have a bunch of subset of units that have tree-based constraint, tree constraints on their activations. Um, and 
And then we have multiple such trees, multiple subset of units in the layer. And so because it's a set of trees, we think of them as a forest. And, um, and it turns out you could formulate the model such that you could have a, a number of tractable computation uh, around doing the inference, so sampling from that model and computing its partition function. And uh, now, I, in the end, I think um, resistible machines are still, I think, to this day, like a bit tricky to train. And this model was no different in, in that respect. So um, it was kind of a nice little exploration of an idea of trying to put structure into a single hidden layer model. Uh, but uh, it didn't go super far, I would say. <laughs> uh, it was more like a neat idea. But again, I think the the, the key message is, or, or the way to contextualize that research, it was part of this sort of line of work, trying to put more structure into a single hidden layer model to try to reflect some of the structure that we sort of assume exists in, in real sort of brain areas within the realms of the same area. The idea of trying to impose structure seems to be an important theme here. That appears in this work architecturally. You mentioned the neural auto regressive distribution estimator work, which of course was also very important. And I think in that there's a kind of structure you're doing, but now it's we want to estimate the density of this joint distribution. And so we can decompose it using the you know basic probability rules into conditional distributions. And then that maybe has an impact on the eventual architectures we think about using down the line. But I guess I thought that component of like, what kind of structure can we impose in different places to make things more tractable was a kind of interesting through line. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. And, and um, with the following work on, on with Nade and then the Mascoto regressive distribution estimator too, um, it was less about putting a structure within layers here, but more like imposing a structure on the which neurons are connected to which within the Ford pass that would lead to us being able to make a case that we were estimating, again, that this model was actually learning something about the input distribution. So again, trying to connect this idea of denoising more directly with the idea of trying to uh, learn a distribution of, of the input data and thinking of that as being um, sort of the driving principle that these models were achieving. And and um, and and yeah, that, that in situations where you actually wanted log likelihoods, it turns out like there was a pretty successful and simple idea that uh, uh, the Masato regressive distribution estimator, in particular, my my student Mathieu Germain, I remember was a master student when I was a professor at Sherbrooke, working really hard on just getting good results, and we were always kind of a little bit underwhelmed, even though we thought the idea was really cool we felt we, we kind of felt well the improvements over nade were they were okay but not super great but thankfully we still managed to kind of uh you know advertise this work get it published and actually a lot of i got a lot of good feedback people finding this idea quite thought-provoking uh so uh it was, it was sort of a nice piece of work to be doing the the next period of your work i'd love to discuss um is kind of between your time at Sherbrooke, and you were also at Twitter during this period, 2011 to 2016. And there's almost a, a bookend here of the ImageNet moment kind of happening at the beginning, and then a little bit later after the end of this slice of time, afterwards, we had the, you know, attention and, and the Transformer network kind of coming a little bit later than that. But at this point, you were coming off of your work with Yasho Benjo, with Jeff Hinton, and we discussed earlier, I guess, about your work all falling within connectionism, but I suppose I'm curious just about how your work with them in a little bit more detail influenced when you set off on your own the directions that you really wanted to pursue and what you thought were the most important questions for you to look at during this time. Yeah, so a lot of the way that I would think about research was often taking a simple idea that I thought had some elegance to it or something intriguing about it and, and exploring it. Uh, but within the general theme of doing some sort of transfer learning. So I really thought training these models on lots of supervised data was great for certain problems where we had this data, but wasn't something kind of sustainable that we could sort of be sure that we could continue doing on, for all the kinds of problems we were hoping to provide and you know, AI-based solutions. 
And so within anything that had something to do about transfer learning, unsupervised learning, if there were some ideas that seemed kind of different from what people were looking into or more promising, I would sort of try to frame a nice hypothesis and an experiment we could sort of explore that. And and I guess another thing, at least with hindsight, that um, so that I've been following are kind of two things. First, trying to work on things that few people are working on. So always sort of thinking about, okay, what's what's an underexplored question? Uh, with deep learning, that became increasingly hard to actually find. Um, but it was all, always kind of a driving idea for how we think about what to do next. And there had to be some sort of interesting algorithmic or sort of principle that was kind of different from other things. Um, and that was kind of in some way intellectually pleasing, which is a weird sort of criteria to have. But thinking that, you know, if if an idea has something like this, then it's going to stir up the community to think differently about a problem. And and maybe with more engineering and later on, this ends up actually having impact. But thinking of the way I can influence the community being more about a compelling idea that it seems like is worth exploring uh, uh, and iterating on. Part of that led to the... Um, at uh, the um, um, adversarial the, uh, the domain adversarial network work, which was the result of well, a lot of people had a similar idea at about the same time. But for me, it was talking to someone who's more a theoretician, talking about some of the domain adaptation research that suggested that a representation that uh, didn't contain information about the provenance of the domain was actually a representation that could generalize to new domains. And so, and and he was like, I, I feel like maybe a neural net could be trained to discover representation like that. And then I came up with the idea that you could do this uh, adversarial type training. Uh, and interestingly, uh, other folks actually came up with the same idea. We ended up sort of partnering with them to publish the journal paper. And that was a pretty um, influential idea. And again, it had this key thing of looking at a problem, a, a, an interesting algorithmic idea. And it was also essentially the confluence of two people working in different domains, but capable of talking with one another. And that's also been kind of a recipe that I found good to repeat for, for new research. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting methodological kind of lesson here. There are a lot of different sorts of papers that appeared during this period. You worked on Bayesian optimization of ML algorithms. You worked a little bit more on the RBM in a few different ways. I, I do want to discuss the infinite restricted Boltzmann machine, but maybe to to preface that introduction, just because I think it's kind of an interesting, fun thing to discuss. I, I suppose it, it feels like there are certain ML algorithms that once were really closely studied, the RBM being one of them, the recurrent neural network being one of them, that have kind of passed out of fashion, as it were. And so I asked somebody this about the RNM, but I'm curious for you, having worked on RBMs for such a long time, do you feel like there are still, for students today who are coming into a deep learning or an ML class, I feel like it's it's very unlikely that they're going to spend much, if any, time with RBMs. And so I'm curious if you feel whether whether you feel that there are still lessons to be learned, whether students today should maybe still be paying attention and trying to learn from the work that was done on these. Yeah, it's a great question, and um, I, and it's so hard to predict. You know what's going to be the missing piece next for a next breakthrough. That by default, I would say like a little bit of exploration into different ideas is is kind of a healthy habit as a researcher. So, without necessarily understanding all the details, kind of revisiting this idea for a little bit, try to see what are is. Because um, I think revisiting older ideas, like that's been a proven recipe in, in many ways, even in this field. Um, and I think intentionally, Jeff Hinton would actually do that quite a bit. Like it seems he had this cycle of about 10 years where, you know, after 10 years, look back at the kind of stuff he was exploring 10 or maybe more years ago and then re-explore it in the current context. And that has led to like a, a number of waves of new ideas that were really interesting. and we could investigate in a different way because we had more compute or we had new ideas we could combine with older ideas that that uh, wasn't possible at the time. There, there are things, there are ideas related to um, 
restricted Boltzmann machines and adjacent research that I feel are maybe could have like an influence in at some point in some field um, or some topic in machine learning and AI. Uh, one of them is, is, so these models are trained by essentially the model generates examples that are roughly uh, from the distribution that it's learned so far. And then the model learns to discriminate between, to classify between real examples and these kind of imagined examples from the distribution. And I guess, you know, this, a similar idea is in some ways behind um, uh, adversarial nets or and GANs, end of adversarial nets. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if similar ideas might come up, like this idea of sort of, quote unquote, hallucinating some examples and then framing an objective that's about distinguishing these from real examples in other contexts. Um, and, and so that's that's kind of like one, in some way, one contribution of, of RBMs to the space of concepts and tools we might use in machine learning. And another one that was explored a bit in RBMs was the notion of fast weights. So the idea that you have a model that has where its weights is a contribution of two things, a set of slow weights and a set of fast weights. The slow weights are trying to accumulate knowledge on, like they, they, they learn much less fast. And in some ways, they're kind of the real weights that you care about in your model. And the fast weights, they're more um, a mechanism for exploring a good set of weights in the, in the space of weights. And in RBMs, actually, they were motivated by the idea that it might drive having a more diverse set of samples from the model. So providing more diversity in the negative samples you would obtain when you were training an RBM, essentially classifying between uh, positive examples, which were from the real, the, the real data, and negative examples that were from the, the ongoing learned uh, distribution. So sometimes like I see this idea of fast weights like coming up as a potential thing to explore in a new setting. Uh, and it, to me, this comes from from that research. So um, those are kind of two things that I associate with RBMs. And someone could argue that there are similar ideas elsewhere. Um, so for that reason, I think it can be a good idea to look at this literature a little bit. And, and if not, just to learn about something completely new, because you never know where it might lead you in terms of thinking about new research ideas in general in the field. Yeah, I, I guess I can imagine that Maybe there are ideas people explored in the context of RBMs that you mentioned the restricted Boltzmann forest didn't go too far. Maybe ideas that people explored in that context uh, didn't go too far then, but maybe have some analogs today that might be worth looking at. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the infinite restricted Boltzmann machine. It seems like there's a good amount of interest in models that incorporate some notion of infinity. I know that like neural tangent kernels were something that people looked at as well. But I, I guess I'd love to hear you talk about the what you introduced here. Yeah, so um, the um, initial thought here was I, uh, at the time, I think there was also a lot of talk about infinite models, in particular in the non-parametric Bayesian community, where the idea was that essentially infinite here sort of relates to properties of these models that they could sort of increase their capacity in some way with the more data you provided uh, and, and sort of adjust it in, in a way that that was uh, natural. So that, which is what made them non-parametric. And I was kind of curious to see, is there, is there a way we could get something similar with a restricted Boson machine? And I kind of figured out a way to allow for assuming conceptually that you had a set, you had an infinite layer where only a subset then the units were ordered and you only had a subset of units that could be active and the other units were essentially uh, could not be active and have and had the uh, um, essentially zero incoming weights and so in some ways it was kind of a neat mathematical challenge that I set myself to try to see whether we could do it um, and as I, as I said sometimes like that's what draws me to an idea and just kind of like hoping for the best and that it will lead to something that is maybe more than just a mathematical trick. But also one motivation for doing that was to, yeah, have a model that could adjust its capacity with time by seeing more ob observations. 
Um, and, and that maybe this would be a mechanism for, for being able to do that with restricts and Boltzmann machines, which we, we didn't know how to do. And uh, that was a model that was not easy to make work. I remember working very hard with my PhD student trying to, and in a way, like it was kind of a really more of a mathematical scientific challenge we're setting ourselves. And then we thought, okay, once, once we figure that out, let's try to um, see whether, you know, it, it's, it's practical. And, and I think in some ways, especially because RBMs we don't use so much anymore, it, it didn't deliver much in terms of solving problems that we couldn't solve in other ways. But, but you never know. I think this is kind of the nature of research. Uh, we at least felt we're exploring something that no one has ever really looked at for this particular model. So who's to say whether it's going to pan out or not? And at a minimum, just to make us as a community think about new things as opposed to, and we're fair, being, I felt fairly bold about the problem we we're trying to to solve from a modeling perspective. Uh, it wasn't kind of an epsilon idea. It was kind of like, oh, like, this, this sounds like a non-trivial thing to solve. And so let's see if we can solve it and let's see what uh, this leads to. Yeah, it's that's an interesting way, I guess, just to kind of remind ourselves that a lot of the time the, the goal of research isn't necessarily I need, you know, a paper that is going to have a significant impact on the code people are writing and the, what they're doing with language models like a week or a month from today, but really just to flesh out and explore, as you said, an, an unexplored new idea in the space of all possible things we could do. And maybe it goes somewhere, maybe it doesn't. But I, I guess it's something, I, I guess I find myself, and I don't know how much others in who are actually doing more research uh, feel about this. It does seem like the way, and I guess the acceleration we've seen recently in terms of the number of papers coming out and the strong connection between those and trying to produce immediate outcomes and how do you interact with your language models. I feel like maybe I find myself not remembering this lesson about the point of research as much. No, I think, I, I mean, it's true. I mean, in some ways, we are seeing some basic ideas that um, are perhaps simpler than other things that we can explore from an algorithmic or modeling standpoint that continue delivering quite a bit of value in terms of what's what's achievable with scale. And we certainly shouldn't stop doing that if that happens to be the better solution. But I think it's, as a community, we, do, we need to do a little bit of exploit and a little bit of explore. You know, it needs to be a portfolio of things that we do. And, and some people are skilled at one kind of work and others at another kind of work. For me, I feel like uh, where I thrive more and I'm, more productive and more uh, uh, useful is to kind of keep doing that kind of innovative exploration of basic ideas of how these models maybe should be working. Um, knowing that, you know, there are going to be phases where maybe we don't discover much and there are going to be phases where this is what's actually needed for us to solve a problem that's, uh, that's going to come and that has come before. Um, so, um, I think I, I try to keep that mindset um, and 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 thinking of not so much of like what is it that I need that that anyone needs to do at a given moment, but thinking more collectively as a community, what is the set of things we should all be doing, and then finding my place within that. Uh, and I found my place to be more in the more speculative, uh, perhaps I would argue somewhat more creative algorithmic and modeling ideas um and 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 in some ways you know no matter what in the end i'm just gonna have more fun doing it so it's not a bad idea to optimize a little bit for your own personal fun uh doing that kind of work right i guess yeah i guess a, a research field as a whole needs all the different types of people doing these different types of work and a single person certainly can't do everything 2017 to now, you've been at Mila and Google Brain and worked on a really wide array of topics and collaboration with many different people. And I think there are quite a few different papers here that motivate some different thoughts on representation learning that I kind of like to dive into. The first one is you had earlier mentioned how there was perhaps more inspiration from the neuroscience community influencing the deep learning community. In modulating early visual processing by language, I think that you 
take uh, some ideas here about, I guess, the way that our language impacts the way that we process things in vision. And I can imagine that this is just very intuitive to people, perhaps. Like, it's not just vision that gets impacted by language, but I think that, you know, in hearing as well, you could listen to a song or the same sequence of words. And I've experimented with this myself, and I'm sure many people have. If you focus your attention on a different sentence, the language actually modulates the sentence that you're hearing, which is just a really interesting way in which there is this kind of cross modal impact. And so you explored, I guess, how you can take an insight like this and apply it to neural networks. And so I'm curious how you were thinking about this from the perspective of we are trying to think about fusing um, embeddings and features from different modalities and then see how we can learn better that way. Yeah. Um, and for this work, I should say the Aaron Corville and, and students in his lab, including the lead student on this work, deserve much more credit for, for pursuing it. But the one key idea that I really like there, and a version of that actually had been explored in a previous work from Aaron Corville's lab. Um, and I know Vincent Dumoulin is one of the contributors to that work and, uh, and other students uh, at the time, was yeah this idea of, of how do you use additional information to influence the kind of activations or representation you would get in some main backbone neural network. And I had seen an earlier version of this research on doing Q&A that was using ideas of modulation like that in a way that was surprisingly effective. And so, and so I got involved in this follow-up project, sort of continuing to explore that and continuing to try to see like, how much leg has this idea of feature-wise linear modulation or film, which is the, the, the particular, I think, key uh, modeling insight and, and tool that, that has found a lot of application in, in, in other research whenever you had this notion that maybe the representation for a given example ought to be influenced by additional inputs or, or contextual inputs that aren't, aren't quite the input you're trying to represent, but they, they give you information about the context in which you're trying to represent that input. And, um, um, and it's just a really neat, simple idea where you essentially have a, a, a neural net standing uh, that, that essentially feeds into the units of the backbone that gets a particular input and just modifies effectively the uh, uh, the simplest version of this idea is just think of it as modifying the biases of these hidden units, but it can also influence the the sort of uh, multiplicative factor that that sort of uh, governs how much activations can change the, the 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 scaling factor of activation change, and um, and also in this work where uh, we were looking at uh, the, there was this particular proposal of of a way of doing. Uh, of getting data for doing question answering from from images uh, ended up being fairly successful. So um, yeah, if people don't know about film feature wise linear modulation, you should you should look it up. There's a nice distilled article that tries to summarize a lot of that research, uh, which was written by Vincent Dumoulin, uh, who's uh, he's at in my team here at uh, at Google uh, and was a professor in, in Aaron Corville's lab. Uh, has a lot of really nice illustration of of this idea that uh, people should enjoy. Kind of building off of the theme here of representation learning, I think that a lot of your work that at least I pulled to discuss during this period kind of goes deeper and maybe motivates some intuitions on this. So there are maybe a few papers that it would be kind of appropriate to group here you and some others introduced the meta data set as an evaluative mechanism for different types of tasks that go beyond just, you know, your standard train test on a single data set. You looked at a universal representation transformer layer for few shot image classification, which I think has its own set of things, a universal template for few shot data set generalization, uh, head to toe on intermediate representations for better transfer learning. I, I guess I'm curious, having worked on all of these different papers with different people thinking about the problem of generalization and then specifically as well, how representations factor into that. I think a motivating theme that you also kind of identify earlier in your work is what makes a good representation. And I think that in part, you kind of answer 
Um, and I think a lot of people answer this way. Well, it has to be useful for some downstream task of interest, which at a very high level of abstraction makes a lot of sense. But I'm curious if there are any more fine-grained intuitions you have about what a good representation should look like. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And indeed, like it's in many ways um, something that's driven a lot of the research that I've enjoyed doing. And um, so starting with metadata set work, Prior to that, I got really, as I said, like the idea of solving new problems and doing a form of transfer learning to learn new tasks from small amounts of data. That was something that I really wanted to tackle. That was kind of a, a big theme of a lot of the research that I've done. Uh, and and early on, I uh, actually at some time, I started getting familiar with this idea of meta learning. So learning to learn. There was some... Um, I mean, this has a longer history, but the work that one of the work that piece of work that influenced me was work from Ryan Adams lab when he was at Harvard, where they showed you could do gradient descent through a gradient descent procedure and actually learn something about the learning algorithm itself, such as tuning the learning rates that were being used. It's a really thought provoking idea. And then to me, this led to the idea that, well, maybe we can then train a learning by gradient descent type procedure uh, to s better generalize on few shot learning problems, problems with small training sets. And this led to the meta LSTM work that I did where uh, essentially the it was uh, where I made the connection between doing forms of gradient descent updates, which are additive with the fact that an LSTM is using a cell update that's also additive. So, um, and and a connected idea that came out a bit after that was also MAML, where you sort of gave up the this sort of interpretation of a, of having a recurrent neural network that is driving a learning process, which is actually literally taking a few steps of gradient descent and backpropagating through it, and then learning uh, specifically the starting point of that gradient descent procedure. And this, so meta learning was a really exciting idea to try to learn how to learn new tasks. Uh, that had small amounts of of data, and um, and then at some point we found out that we we felt the problems we were investigating this idea with were too toy or small or had were themselves like too simple in terms of the type of problems we were doing meta learning on the number of and the diversity of classification tasks we're doing meta learning on so learning a mechanism for for learning from small amounts of data. And so that's where metadata set came from, is trying to have a bigger benchmark for evaluating methods that are doing, trying to do few shot learning. It's metadata set because it's a data set of data set. Um, and, and then we started committing much more to the problem and less committed about specifically doing, using ideas from meta learning to solve it. And some of the work we explored was based on meta learning. So the idea of presenting a lot of few shot learning problems to a meta model that would sort of learn to produce good classifiers on a lot of few shot learning problems and the hope that it would produce good classifiers on new few shot learning problems to investigating other aspects of what might be a good solution, such as the inductive bias of the backbone itself uh, and for images in particular, looking at uh, aliasing problems and how we could address those um, and slowly started taking more of a step back and thinking about, I guess, really the problem, the general problem that I'm interested in is how can we, what are good practices for doing what it would call, you know, recycling deep learning. So taking some amount of training you've done on some data that's represented by a big neural network and figure out what are the good practices for leveraging that in a way that you could then sort of recycle of that compute that had been done towards solving better a, down, a new problem in, in a way that's faster in terms of compute and faster in terms of data you need to solve it. And uh, head to toe later on and more recently was like one attempt at doing that, which is to say, let's forget about meta learning. Uh, let's just think about, um, and let's really um, try to improve on a very simple baseline 
that was still like very competitive and robust, which is to just fine tune. You just start from your pre-trained model that was trained in some way. So let's not address how you pre-train, but it's just address how do you adapt this pre-trained model to a downstream task. And fine tuning was, uh, you know, still like a very successful approach. And uh, and one of the thoughts there was to think, well, maybe actually the representation is already in there. It doesn't need to be tuned. It just needs to emerge and be accessible to the output head. And there the idea was just then to think of, well, the output layer, let's just connect it to a bunch of intermediate layers in the backbone. Now, that's a lot of units. So uh, there's a lot of potential for overfitting. So even though we're training a linear classifier on some on features, we're training it on a lot of features, like potentially millions of features. So there's a lot of opportunity for overfitting. And so to try to combat that, and with also the insight that, you know, maybe some features in certain layers are not useful for a particular downstream task. Let's impose some sort of sparsity regularization on so that it kind of picks the specific units that are useful for that problem. And that ended up being a surprisingly effective approach, competitive with fine tuning in many ways. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, this kind of, you know, series of papers in some ways, yeah, I I think of them as um, exploring a lot of different dimensions of what makes a good representation for few shot learning and transfer learning, and how and also how best to leverage it. You know, where is the good representation? And head to toe, that was a little bit that maybe it's already in there. It's just we need to dig deeper into the network to actually find it. And so, I think we're still sort of looking into. There's still a lot of questions and a lot of exploration to do about find sort of refining our understanding of what are the right properties of a good uh of a good pre-trained model but a lot of that research has sort of helped determining you know the potential of of a number of of answers for that question there are a lot of interesting i think connections and lessons here so i guess in head to toe the way you're, you articulated what you were doing did remind me a lot of the convex combination of pre-trained weights in the Fuchsia data generalization paper. And I guess another kind of perspective here too is I think that in one of the other papers, a universal representation transformer layer, you and the other authors used exactly the term universal representation, which I find very evocative because I guess looking at the training of a neural network on a single data set and you think about maybe the manifold perspective of, of data and what the neural network is kind of learning to do there. If you maybe take that view and just sort of expand it, then you maybe have a question, okay, if I'm looking to learn something that is fully general or like universal in the sense that most people would think about it, is maybe combining a set of models trained on different data sets the appropriate way to do it? Or even if I have a meta learner or something, and I'm able to handle the learning of different data sets, well, maybe even that suite of data sets that I've encompassed, maybe that itself is kind of on some sort of manifold in the all possible data space. And I do know, I think with metadata set, for example, I imagine, you know, one of the clear extensions is, well, just increase the number of data sets. But I do feel like there's a, a big question here of, like, what the data sets kind of have on offer, and then maybe the representativeness in terms of what can we learn and can we learn something that is truly universal per se? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, it speaks to a larger question, which is, yeah, what is the right pre-training data set? And what is the right way of decomposing um, our representation of, of all of that data set? Um, and um, in some ways, um, Right now, you know, the solution of just training a really, really large transformer model and hope that it sort of figures out internally the right representation has been quite successful. But certainly the problem of determining what's the right pre-training data set for that model so that it it actually has implicitly the the flexibility of representing many different situations and many different types of problems that you'd want to solve, I think it's, it's still quite an open problem. I think when, when I did the work on metadata set in particular, it started becoming more and more obvious that, uh, which in some ways, you know, it certainly ob was obvious to a lot of people, but 
it was kind of the first time that I was trying to think more thoroughly about a benchmark. And then it kind of became clear that actually, like, what do you decide to put in the training set will have a huge influence. Um, and we know larger training set is better, but here we had much more flexibility in terms of what kind of tasks that we would put in. So even the notion of what is the data distribution is uh, became even more flexible and something that realized we needed to understand even better. Um, and and so a lot of the work that I guess I've done has been uh, to try to see like if we have if you have a particular data set, like how is it that you make sure that all of it is represented in the right way and in a way you can sort of recompose, you can have a sort of um, decompose representation of different aspects of data and then recompose it when it comes to tacking a downstream task and trying to think about, you know, are there uh, certain architectural principles that might help the transformer, uh, the... Um, universal transformer layer, that was kind of the idea. Maybe it's just a matter of doing, let's try a simple thing, which is linearly combining different representations. Um, and But I think there's even more to explore probably. And maybe this will come in handy at some point as we start, whether we start realizing that, you know, just scaling a large transformer hits some wall and we need to be a bit more clever about um, how to actually influence the inductive principle of, of these kinds of models. I do want to dive a little bit into your thoughts on scaling in a second, but just before that, as a last paper to mention here, you worked with my wonderful friend, Hadi Joe on fortuitous forgetting, which I think was a very interesting mm -hmm. paper. And anybody listening who listened to my episode with her will have heard a little bit of the introduction to that paper. But I guess I'm, I'm curious just to hear maybe a second perspective on that paper and maybe some of your takeaways and directions that you think it, it kind of implies. Yeah. Um, so I, and Heidi does deserve a lot of the credit for this work. She really pushed it through and, mm -hmm. um, and in some ways I feel like Aaron Corville and I are co-directors mostly contributed the title where we <laughs> insisted on using the, uh, inserting the word connectionist in it, which was an old term, uh, but it was kind of a play on a, an older paper, which is kind of associated as the catastrophic forgetting kind of observation um, and uh, and used it and it was in the connectionist time where that word was not so dated. Um, and I have... Um, I'm still thinking a lot about what's the next step for some of this work. It has proven very effective in the context of reinforcement learning. So in Aaron's lab, there's a lot of work on actually retraining the agent while keeping the replay buffer and uh, and connections to essentially like reducing plasticity and addressing this by essentially just resetting the, the weights, which you can do because you're keeping this replay buffer so a neural net can sort of quickly re-remember what it's learned. Um, and I've been wondering about, so in, in the particular paper we did with Hattie, we explored supervised learning. And then we had also had this, uh, Lewis game that was about language emergence. Um, I have been wondering about, but I don't quite, this is kind of ongoing, like whether some of these ideas might also be meaningful and valuable for out of distribution generalization, which I haven't explored as much. Um, so part of the, so one insight in this particular work is that maybe essentially good features that generalize well are features that are useful in many contexts. And one way of kind of simulating having many contexts is if you have a neural net that trains and then the top layers, they keep being reset. So, but you never reset the bottom layers. And that means their representation here needs to be good in, in some ways for many multiple uh, nonlinear heads, which you can think of that being sort of the the rest of the network that keeps being resetted. And I don't think we've studied so much the whether there are implications in terms of out of distribution generalization of these types of features. features. How well do they transfer? Um, so I think that's one direction. If this insight of like features that are useful in many contexts are just good features, well, presumably then we would observe that if we 
started looking at transfer learning scenarios and other distribution generalization. And the other area where I don't think this has been explored, but I'm curious, I don't have a very good reason to know that this would help, but essentially self-supervised learning um, approaches as well, where um, some of these methods have a notion of kind of a replay buffer or some or something like there being kind of a teacher and maybe there's value in resetting the student from time to time, but keeping the teacher and maybe that gives a better representation. Um, I think these are interesting sort of next steps that uh, I'd like to see uh, us or other people explore. One connection that I was thinking about when I first read the paper, I think I mentioned this to Hadi as well, was there was this paper um, a couple of years ago out of DeepMind, I want to say it was like a big collaboration where they were studying the training process of Alpha Zero. And I guess the thing that connected it to forgetting for me was in its training process, Alpha Zero would sort of go through these phases where it learned perhaps intuitions about how to play a chess game that maybe reflected certain tactics that a human might ordinarily use. And then it totally forgot about whatever representation led it to actually do those things. And as, of course, you can imagine that forgetting for some reason or another turned out to be good, given that Alpha Zero at the end of the day does end up beating every human. Um, but that was that was kind of like one other domain that I was thinking about as well, I guess, in, in the RL space. No, interesting. Um, I think generally the idea of the value of forgetting is something that probably can be explored further. Uh, there might be things in the neuroscience field that might bring ideas about um, what kind of questions to explore. And I've heard this kind of interesting thought. I think the first I heard it was from Max Welling, though I'm not sure if it comes from him, but I heard him say it, which was that in some ways you could think of forgetting as being the reason why we have to generalize, because if we never forgot anything, then maybe we could just memorize everything. And that in some ways there's maybe a really valuable, I mean, that's another way of advocating for the value of forgetting, which is it essentially forces um, a model or us to have to generalize because we can't memorize. We can't rely just on memorization. And so that's why I feel like in some ways, this is a general idea that ought to have more impact than um, just in very specific setting, but in learning-based systems overall. That's a That's an interesting way to put it. I'd love to move to some, I guess, discussion of it's a really interesting time to be somebody in the machine learning world. I feel there's, I, I think anybody who spends any amount of time on Twitter gets quickly tired by the number of papers that are coming out, the discourse on scaling, where that is going, what are limitations, different reactions to GPT-4, auto GPT, now we have chaos GPT. Um, it's, I, I think I find it, you know, just becoming a lot and <laughs> I guess there, but at the same time, there, there do seem to be still a few kind of key debates that people are having right now. You have the perspectives on, is the scaling hypothesis true? Are we going to hit some asymptote sometime soon? Are, you know, LLM, some people have the very reductive picture of them as just next word predictors, but then the argument that once you introduce instruction tuning and RLHF, there's something a little bit different there. And people will say that the emergent behavior that they seem to exhibit says something else must be going on. Some people are now questioning whether emergent behavior is actually a thing. I think a paper just came out questioning this. And so I guess in, in the midst of all of these conflicting questions, I'm curious where you maybe land on some of the issues in terms of thinking about the scaling hypothesis about LLMs and sort of what the promising directions are right now. Yeah, um, I um, I take a, I mentioned this kind of portfolio point of view of what the field ought to be doing. And, um, and certainly the scaling hypothesis was worth exploring. It's demonstrated already that there are definitely legs to that hypothesis. Um, but I hear of 
some people also saying that maybe we're going to run out of data at some point sooner than later, uh, which means I would want to go further, then we need to be prepared to come up with other innovations uh, for learning for on, on that. Sure, you know, humongous, but still, you know, finite amount of data. Um, I think questions about, you know, related to in some way or another to recycling deep learning. So taking this big pre-trained model and then figure out the best ways of adjusting it and adapting it to a downstream task is something that actually, you know, certainly on a smaller scale, but I think people can still explore in reasonable amount of compute. And there's a fairly now thriving open source ecosystem around even larger language models where I think ideas can be explored there and an hypothesis can be laid out in ways that are should be informative to the way the field as a whole evolves. Um, and so really, um, um, uh, those would be the things I keep in mind. First, I think we s still, you know, recently it seems I keep hearing that even uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI is advocating that there needs to be some changes to these architectures so uh, as to make more progress. Um, and and that's certainly a possibility, you know, irrespective of whether he says it or anyone else. We, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen next. And I think as a community, we need to kind of cover all of our bases in some way. And then picking like which one do you, are you most excited about um, is probably a good approach. Um, and and just thinking of addressing these questions in a way that's scientific, you know, like lay out an hypothesis and figure out what's the, with the resources you have, the best way of answering, of, of exploring that hypothesis and whether it's true or not. And that's how I tried to approach it myself. And I would encourage people to do as well. I think this might actually be a good segue to the creation of the TMLR journal, just because I often wonder about some of the, we talk about explore, exploit, in the realm of doing research. And I think that right now, there is a lot of exploit going on. We figured out a hypothesis that seems to hold water. And a lot of people are really wringing as much out of the towel as they possibly can. I don't know to what extent this is true. But I suppose one comment that I often hear made is that publication norms and the process of, of conferences and all of that, that maybe exploit behavior is a little bit encouraged more. And so you kind of have this set of incentives that are going on. People want to trace after prestige. And that, of course, has, you know, is, is naturally something people would want to do. And with TMLR, I know that you were trying to address a number of the issues that people commonly find with conferences. So I guess I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what those were and what you hope that TMLR can do to push publication culture and ML in a better direction. Yeah. So uh, the there are many motivations that kind of converged, but one of them was definitely that I, having been involved in conferences quite a bit, it became apparent to me that conferences were kind of playing this dual mission that we're often confusing, which is first evaluate the um, scientifically the work. Like, is it making claims that it convincingly demonstrate with evidence? And then it was also trying to find amongst these papers that do that, um, which ones are particularly exciting? And the second question is very subjective, actually, and, and leads to frustration. Like people just don't understand why the reviewer isn't is, is not more positive about their work. They might not be saying that you didn't do it properly. They're just saying they're not as excited about it as maybe something else. And that is kind of what a conference a conference is an event. It's it's kind of a show also, and it's trying to showcase things that will interest the scientific community in in this case. And so I kind of felt it made sense to separate the two to have to try to have a process that really assesses our claims matched by proper convincing evidence and, and make that the criteria for some recognition of acceptance and then deal with, okay, but amongst all of this work, what is most exciting? Knowing that this is editorial, this is subjective and, and then finding ways. So in Tamil art, the way that we're trying to do this is to have certifications that sort of highlights 
papers amongst those that are accepted. And now we're starting also to try to work with some conferences that would take accepted TMLR publications and uh, from these, for those that kind of line up with the ty- type of topic that they're exploring in, in, in their event, flag the TMLR papers that seem exciting enough that they'd want to feature it at their event. So we are starting, the first conference we're starting to do that is AutoML. Um, and uh, then there's um, uh, Cola, Cola's uh, on, on lifelong learning that we're the second conference we're going to be working with to who will identify TMLR papers that they want to give an event certification that is essentially saying it has the seal of approval from our event. And what I'm hoping to see in the hopefully not so long future is that uh, we can work with many venues like that, smaller and bigger. And so we can have an ecosystem of these kinds of event certifications. And now, you know, someone who's particularly interested in one type of um, topic that is really well served and a particular community and their norms that will be able to just focus on TMLR papers that have been sort of given this certification by this particular event. And and, uh, this will require time. So we're working with smaller conferences to kind of test that model. But this is kind of like the longer term vision for TMLR, trying to address this particular element that I think is dissatisfying for, for the community. And then other things is just having a venue where there's no deadline, you can submit any time, but still sort of fits with the conference uh, paper format, which is shorter, which people seem to find sufficient. Um, trying to be as uh, fast turnaround as possible and so on. A lot of these things and, and a few others were kind of drivers for, for doing TMLR in the first place. I, I do like the point of really separating that that separation of concerns of is this a work that has good scientific quality versus is it exciting to us? And I, I definitely see how the conflation of those two things can certainly lead to maybe less motivation for a reviewer who's just like, I really don't find this work interesting at all to actually be willing to evaluate the accuracy of the claims. So I, I guess I'm excited to see how this impacts the, the publication culture. As a last question or set of questions, you have spent a long time really doing ML research. And I think in that process, you've had to learn some of these individual lessons about doing ML research and being a good scientist, and then kind of expanding that as you became a professor, as you built research groups at Twitter and Google, how to well, build a research group, but then also nurture a good research environment. I'd love to hear you maybe elaborate on some of the lessons you've taken away, both for yourself as a researcher, but then also helping others grow into researchers. Yeah, I think one of the main thing that I really care about that I find is a good recipe for nurturing sort of uh, good research hygiene in in the research environment and in a group has been so fostering diversity of ideas and trying to create spaces where different areas, different domains, different ideas can sort of clash with one another or meet and to potentially create something that's, that is completely new. Um, because you can sort of intuitively, if you take two very different ideas by virtue of being different, maybe they've never actually been in the same conversation or you know, even considered as like, what did it mean to do something that takes a bit of both? And so therefore, that rarity means that if we do find something, this, you know, a, a new insight or a new breakthrough, it might just be there at the intersection of, of ideas that rarely meet. And, and for me, you know, the work on domain adversarial network is one I often mention where it was me meeting w- with a theoretician we knew each other enough that we were able to talk and we kind of found something at the intersection that had not been found before. And that was a pretty uh, impactful idea. So I'm trying to reproduce conditions for these kinds of meetings of ideas. Um, and so I think that's one of the key thing that, that, that I'm trying to sort of make sure there are these venues for these kinds of sparks of innovation to happen. I think that's a, a really good perspective. I, I suppose maybe as a, a final, final question, for somebody who maybe today is kind of wondering about 
I think you've already commented a little bit on this in terms of keeping a portfolio of things to work on and classes of ideas, but it does seem like we're in this kind of compute dominated phase of ML research. And I hear many people commenting that the field is just turning into an engineering discipline, which I, I, I don't think is exactly right, but you do hear a lot of people saying that. I think amidst all that, um, especially speaking with researchers like yourself, I find myself just reminded of, you know, there is immense value to ideas and things that are not purely engineering. And I think that people seem to need to be reminded by that. But for somebody who's maybe growing up in this tradition we're in, who is doing their PhD, who is thinking about going into ML, doing research, what what would your advice be for them in terms of just thinking about how to how to articulate themselves and their ideas in this phase of research that we seem to be in? Yeah, um, I I think um, the approach to take is to really take in scientific. If you're going to be limited by resources, take the scientific mindset. Given the resources that you have, what's the um, and given the hypothesis that you have, what's the best way of exploring it? Um, and because, you know, like the large scale today is maybe going to be not so large scale, you know, in two years. So in a way, we're not working on the right scale for what might be key observations in two years, even if we have less compute than groups that have more compute. So I try to remind myself that and then really just try to frame the question in a scientific way such that I can make it somewhat independent of the scale and I can still get to an insight, a concept, an idea, as opposed to a concrete sort of, you know, numerical result that will drive the conversation. And, you know, honestly, being aware that, you know, that there is some amount of like, yeah, if computationally the experimentation is very impressive and large scale that maybe that's more likely to, excite people in some ways. Part of the reason why we're on TMLR is so that there's like a space for these, this other type of research that, um, where I think you can still, you know, you need to be a good storyteller in some ways. Like you need to make a compelling case for your, why exploring the hypothesis that uh, you're proposing is important and, and make a case for why exploring it the way you're doing it has influence uh, or make a good case for exploring this idea further. Um, but yeah, I think just grounding everything you do in in, in, in scientific terms, uh, which I think can help sort of um, not be feeling constrained by the scale at which you're exploring ideas. I think that's really helpful advice and a great place to end. Um, Professor Larichel, I want to thank you for spending all this time chatting with me today. Um, it's It's really an honor to speak with you. And I hope that anybody listening to this learns as much as I did. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the conversation. You took me back to, to fun memories of, of many years ago. So it was really fun. Thank you. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.